From a boss who finds out that his workers are sabotaging all of his hard work, to a boss who realizes that he wasn't paying close attention to a department that was harming his company, this video is gonna get heated. Today's video is all about the times when people lost it on Undercover Boss. We're starting things off with one of the most explosive bosses in the series history, Stephen J. Kobeck. In the fourth episode of the fourth season, we were introduced to Diamond Resorts. We got to see Mr. Kobeck going undercover in Cabo Azul Resort Spa, Mexico, to ensure that all of his properties are working at a high bar. I'm at the Cabo Azul Resort and Spa. It's the singular reason I wanted to buy Pacific Monarch Resorts. This is the one property in Pacific Monarch's chain that I have already approved to become a Diamond Resort. Compared to the other properties I visited on my journey, I think it's clear that the Diamond way of doing things has made it to this resort. And one of the things that makes this property unique is its spa. We get to see him work at the front desk to get an understanding of whether the people are doing their job the way they're supposed to do. The one job I haven't done in my journey thus far is working at the front desk. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens here today. We're then introduced to Stephanie as the woman at the front desk. But that doesn't go all that well. You'd be shocked to find out that they had been breaking the law unknowingly, owing to their blatant ignorance. I read online, though, because mm -hmm. I'm trying to learn all the, the workings on it. And the laws say that you can't keep credit card numbers. Well, I'm... I'm not aware or informed of that, but here at the hotel, we have to. That's directly for management, and I don't... Really? But there are privacy laws on that. You're probably right. So things didn't get off to a good start there. The system also displays a little problem. It functions a bit too slowly. Does this system work good? Yeah, sometimes it's a little bit slow. What's surprising, though, is that Stephanie isn't even aware that she actually represents Diamond Resorts. She thinks it's Monarch Grande that she's working for. Monarch Grande has a lot of different hotels, so we have to access Who's the one that? from Kawasul. They're the owners of the timeshare. I'm sure I would have had an issue with that as well. Diamond Resorts owns this property. I own this property. I've got Diamond guests checking in. They expect to be coming to a Diamond Resort property. And if the front desk receptionist doesn't know she's representing Diamond Resorts, that's a problem for me. With that, a guest comes up to the front desk. I was just about to go over my bill. I thought that you might be interested in some of the discrepancies we come across. Why say you're giving a 10% discount when you're not actually going to? Entirely kills the credibility of the hotel. First of all, there's a card that gives you 10% off discounts. And there's all these items that were not discounted because they didn't present the card ahead of time. I'm mortified. There were numerous discounts that should have been afforded. The entire bill was wrong. But there's some more. We could sense how difficult it must have been for Mr. Kobeck to witness from behind the desk all the serious management shortcomings. I was so, so upset that the guest was mistreated. It was very impossible for me to sit behind that desk hearing so many things that were wrong. And I just, I was so frustrated, I couldn't stand it anymore. So naturally, he totally loses his mind and reveals his identity. I own this place, Stephen J. Klubeck. I own Diamond Resorts. I'm not happy. I'm really not happy about this. Well, Come on, guys. I just How can we make this mistake? Now comes the part where he communicates with the employees separately. He conveys his extreme disappointment at the blunders they've been making. But he comes to realize why the front desk isn't at fault, because they weren't trained properly for it. It's a transition here, and it's not your fault. It's not their fault. No, they were not trained it right. properly. And he realizes how there's a massive communication breakdown among the staff that's putting all the names that he built into the ground. He makes a conscious effort into getting a transition, and so all is well and good at the end. Guess he did make it work eventually. Moving on to the next one from Season 6, Episode 1. This boss pretty much got a shocker on finding out how laid back an entire department is. So we're talking about real estate mogul Armando Montalongo. This one's a great man and pretty much the single largest flipper in America. So let's first find out more about the place he's visiting. Flipping 400 homes each year and leading educational seminars across the country, the Armando Montalongo companies bank $75 million annually. In the episode, he headed to the Montalongo headquarters in San Antonio, Texas, where he'll be working in his own call center to see if his brand is actually being represented in the right way or not. 
let's see if that's actually the case now. You looking for Amanda? I'm Amanda. You must be Kevin. Kevin Jones. I am one of the team leads here at Armando Montalongo Seminars. Mm -hmm. So what we do here is we take inbound phone calls as well as making calls for these leads to go to our free preview events. Mm -hmm. As a team lead, I overlook about 15 to 16 people. I make sure the quality is there on the phone calls, the professionalism is there. They have a 200 call per day quota that they need to hit, so I make sure that they hit those as well. Okay, we already sense it. There's a lot of do work as we can see, and it just keeps getting piled on. But what happens next is hysterical. So as you can see, you have a lot of people that are non-attended, but you also have people that have rescheduled, um, that canceled. So you want to try to talk them into going because this is a life-changing event. Yeah, maybe he's just better with his actual work. She feels he doesn't have much enthusiasm over the phone call. As I'm training Kevin, I'm a bit worried that he's not catching on the way that I thought he would. He definitely needs to just be a little more enthusiastic on the phone calls. That's probably because he's preoccupied with other emotions. Soon after which, another sign of total carelessness is displayed. As he begins to work on the system, the computer just stops working. And to this, Amanda gives a lame excuse that sometimes it just tends to have hiccups. Sometimes with so many systems being going in here with the same program, it tends to just hiccup sometimes. But is that okay? Of course not. How is that despite having a large staff, no one has ever cared enough to have this fixed? As for the boss, he obviously lost it at this point. The thing that's shocking me and frankly really, really upsetting me is no one's doing anything about this. What the hell? I can't wait anymore. This problem has to be fixed now. We're just as upset too. They've normalized working this way and they're as unbothered as anybody could get. And that's when he breaks character and reveals his real identity to everybody. Hi, this is Armando. Do you guys know who I am? And do you guys realize that I've been here undercover? I'm doing an episode of Undercover Boss. The reason why I'm doing this is to get to know my business better. He gives everybody a piece of his mind, saying how if the system is down, they should be calling IT and have it fixed. And in this call center, we have a major problem. And when our systems are down, you guys got to be calling IT. You've got to be all over it. Like, don't just have them fix it upstairs. Bring them down here and have one of them here until it's fixed. You got to let me know what tools you guys need. And then he sits down with Amanda to discuss it all. She claims that the call center doesn't receive the same level of attention as the other departments, and that may be the problem. I think the call center doesn't get as much as attention as the other departments get from you. They call the call center the hood. Armando is aware that in order to make meaningful progress, he needs to dedicate more of his focus to this area. And everything turns out for the better. Next, we have the CEO of one of the fastest growing fitness chains in the United States, Retro Fitness. We're talking about Eric Cassabury, who goes undercover in Season 4, Episode 14. And he ends up going to Fairlawn, New Jersey Retro Fitness, where he'd be working at the front desk. Expectations can really lead to some serious disappointments. It seems to have a good start at the beginning. But when he meets the front desk executive Jacqueline, things take a turn for the worst. She first starts off saying how she likes to manage the gym how she sees fit, and then goes on to complain about people approaching her with inquiries. She then begins to criticize them for not understanding much about the machinery. That is, after all, the very purpose of them joining there. And you might think that's all to it, but no. She expresses how she wants to punch the people in the face who, by the way, are the members there. Despite being an industry where you have to create relationships with people, she can't even stand them. At this point, I would have blown off my cover and fired her straight away had I been in his place. Good thing Eric's got some patience. Soon after this, Jacqueline starts teaching him how to make a smoothie. Of course, with all the professionalism comprised. She advises him to ignore the book's instructions, which takes into account all the proper ratios for a healthy drink, and instead makes him focus on making the drink taste delicious. Of course, Eric ignores it all and sticks to the book. And here's how Jacqueline responds to it. Excuse me? I don't think Barry understands that I work here every single day and I know what I'm doing. I know my I've been here for two years. You're so condescending and rude to me, I really can't stand it. Oh, I would never be. Just wait, baby. After acting like it's actually Jacqueline's juice bar, she really has the nerve to call him condescending. And what about people skills? And that's a lot of narcissism, if anything. And the juice bar accounts for an average of 15% of the gym's annual earnings. So we know it's a crucial element of the gym that she has absolutely no regard for. In fact, if there's any extra juice left, she directly throws it away. A lot of people who are members there have also experienced her horrible attitude. But good job, Eric, for keeping up with it for this long. 
He then decides to speak with Sarah, the franchisee, and gets things straightened up. And finally, moving on to the last entry from Season 4, Episode 9. The CEO of Boston Market, the leader in on-the-go home-style meals in the country, sends Sarah Bitter, his chief brand officer, on an important mission. She goes to Georgia to work as an hourly shift supervisor. So Rachel's got really high hopes here. In fact, she was expecting the employees to have a positive and energetic attitude whilst being welcoming and warm towards the customers. And here's Ronnie displaying just that. Standard procedure is to greet the customer as they walk in, say hello, welcome to Boston Market, you know, blah, 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 whatever. Because we have to make customers, you know, on a pedestal. Yeah, we weren't expecting that. He continues by saying that since that is what corporate is supposed to represent, they should be covertly forcing food down the customers' throats. But he got it all wrong. Seems like Jacqueline from the earlier episode and Ronnie here can totally work out the food and drink sector their way. And here comes some more enthusiasm he has for his job. This is a sandwich station. I hate making sandwiches. Customers always have something picky about a sandwich to do. My least favorite part is the customer always has to be right. I absolutely hate that. That's a lot of hate in a few sentences. Why take up a job that you feel this way about? He then goes out to smoke during the work hours without giving a damn about his duties. And what you're about to hear next is going to blow you away. Children and old people are literally the worst I've ever seen in my entire life. You just kind of have to deal with it. Our guests are our bread and butter. They pay our checks. They keep our, our businesses open. They pay his paycheck. Yes, but he has little care for the customers. I guess he should join some place where he doesn't have to interact with people. And it obviously pisses off Rachel. He goes on to express a little more hate for customers, calling them little bitches. After repeatedly listening to all of it, Rachel just cannot take it anymore. She later reveals her real identity, and that very minute Ronnie understands that he's messed it up big time. My name is Sarah Bidorf, and I am the Chief Brand Officer of Boston Market. No. And you're on Undercover Boss. <gasps> oh my god. Honestly, it's the moment we were all longing for. And guess what else we were all longing for? Your valuable support. And for this, all you have to do is drop a like and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. With that done, let's see what happens next. Rachel expresses just how disappointed she is in finding out this is how he feels about the customers. She doesn't even think it's the right business for him. But don't you have to interact with people at every facet of your life? So maybe this type of approach has no place in any kind of business. Ronnie tells her that he'd be willing to work on it, but Rachel eventually ends up getting him fired. So go home and um, Neil will follow up with you. So that's it? That's, that's all? She's not wrong for wanting the right people for the steady flow of her business. And maybe that's going to be a big lesson for Ronnie. With that, sadly, we've come to the end of the video. Which employee did you find to be the worst? Let us know in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, guys.